Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Real Estate Master Class. Um, a big part of the reason why I wanted to teach how to build a real estate team and do a second volume of this is because I taught this class before six years ago. And it's actually my, I think my number one video on YouTube, and I'm not a huge YouTuber, but it has over 11,000 11, views and 179 likes. And when there was still dislikes, there was no dislikes, a lot of positive feedback. And, uh, and I wanted to expand on it because the truth is, is there's a lot of things that you learn along the way. Um, and it's better for everybody if I get an opportunity to revisit these things so that people don't walk into some of the same traps that I walked into. Um, don't, um, you know, and a lot of that uh, can be of our own doing. And so I want to teach people how to build a real estate team. This is an in-depth master class about how to hire, how to run your team, how to build a team, et cetera, and so forth. If you want these, these slides, please feel free to text me. Please feel free to call me 951-691-7798. Big part of the reason why I can do these classes is because eXp Realty has put me in a situation where I have some passive income. I can build, I can take time doing things that don't directly benefit me and benefit you. And uh, of course, if I go over anything contract wise, it's because it's California specific. And I don't think there's too much of that here. But, um, and then finally, I'm a mad scientist. I'm an ENTP. Some people will just want to see the world burn, right? We deserve a better class of real estate agents. Um, I want to empower people and throw off the balance structure. I want to take real estate from a situation where it's, you know, not practiced on golf courses and in wineries, but in high schools and then on Main Street. And that's how you really properly um, serve a community by being an integral part of a community. And I love learning. I love teaching. And so I really feel fortunate that anybody shows up to listen to these and that anybody watches them online. So uh, happy holiday weekend, everybody. Let's uh, jump into this. And of course, success leaves breadcrumbs. I like to leave uh, outlines and blueprints. Um, make sure before you build a real estate team that you want it first and foremost, that you really want it um, and follow that through. Really think about what that means to be a real estate team leader and uh, to your daily tasks and how many people that opens you up to. Uh, make sure that you can afford it. <clears throat> it costs time and money to build a business. It really costs time and money to build a real estate team. And so make sure that you're investing that time and money and make sure that you have the time to do it. Sometimes I hear people say that they want to build a real estate team because they uh, they don't have time. You know, they are full time in the military and hey man, ambition, I appreciate it, respect. But at the end of the day, you can't um, commit yourself to something that you don't have time for. So just be careful that if you if you do have a full time job, this is a side hustle. You do decide to start a team. Make sure that you, your niche is secure and that you're offering people systems and procedures that can continue to operate when you're not available. Now, in this class, like I said, uh, this was um, the video here that we did and uh, and it was a lot of fun. I taught it in front of my real estate team. They're actually in the front row there. And 100% of those people went on to make six figures um, a year, which is great. Now, in this class, we're going to go over how to build a team, who to hire, and when to hire them, types of teams that you could build. Um, and we'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, I wanted to dedicate a slide to it, but at the end of the day, it wasn't that important. So we just kind of cut it in, or edited it down. I want to teach people how to fish instead of handing them a fish. And how do you do that? Um, I want to go over some unconventional wisdom, uh, opportunities to avoid the mistakes that I made, and then uh, learn from the first class that I taught six years ago. Um, now, why do I do it? I want to build a kingdom for my family. I want to build a name that has equity in it. And I enjoy working with my family. Um, now, tips on working with your family. If you're going to start a team with your team, or excuse me, if you're going to start a team with your family, especially in the beginning, be careful. Because if you don't have an authority on the, the topic at hand, um, and you're starting a team with two chiefs um, and not enough Indians, so to speak, uh, you could really put yourself into some trouble and put your relationship into some trouble. Establish roles based on strengths. If you are two high D personalities, um, be careful. Make sure that you are dividing and conquering. Um, develop strong systems and procedures. Um, and of course, teach your kids early. If you want to involve your children in your business, which I hear a lot of people that want to do that, um, this is something that I sounded out with my sister um, and we talked about it with our kids. Uh, 
The difference between having an employee mindset and having an ownership mindset. So saying, hey, listen, if you want, I will pay you, you know, if they're, you know, uh, young, 15 cents a door to hang flyers or, you know, uh, $20 an hour or $15 an hour, whatever it is that you agree on with your kids. Or you can be my partner and I will give you 5% of my closings. And so um, give them one or the other. And then that way they have an opportunity to decide, do I want to be an employee or do I want to be an owner? Uh, now, when you hire, you want to hire to accommodate your weaknesses. Um, understand that you are not the best person for every job. You want to hire people who are talented in the ways in which you lack. Hire talent, train skill. Which And what does that mean? Find people that have the capacity to be great at the job that you are uh, that you are hiring for, not necessarily people who are currently great at it, um, because you want to train them in their skill set, help them uh, develop that skill set. But uh, you want to make sure that you're hiring the talent, the blank slate that you can paint on or help them to paint on. Uh, pay well, provide value. If you're not paying well, uh, you better uh, you better not be charging. Or excuse me, if you're not providing value, you better not be charging very much. If you are providing tons of value and the systems and procedures are so great that it's helping your team to close more deals and helping them to net more, then you could charge more potentially. And of course, we can talk about that more later. Uh, free people up to do what they do best. Now, some of the cardinal rules for starting a team, don't start a team with an eye on the exit. A lot of people will say in, in their first year in real estate, they'll say, and listen, I started a team, I think 10 months into uh, real estate, my real estate career in my first year. Not everyone is gonna have the success that I had. And of course, I had success already in those 10 months before I started a team. Closed, you know, I think about 25 transactions. So if you're starting a team, don't start it with an eye on the exit. Oh, well, I'm starting a team because I wanna remove myself from my business. You don't have a business yet, you haven't closed a deal. Now lay out clear expectations for both you, the team lead, and your team members. You want them to know what they can expect of you. What is the value that you're offering? Have a clear signed operating agreement. In my last class, I talked about contracts. Contracts ultimately in real estate, a lot of times between team leads and agents are very difficult to enforce. Um, and so just an operating agreement. Hey, this is how we operate. This is the handshake. And then of course, turning that operated, operating agreement into your broker. Too many cooks spoil the pot. So consider the source, consider who uh, you're, you're talking to and ultimately you have to be the one who is making the decisions at the end of the day. Take all of the input and then determine what the output is going to be. Now set out to serve, not to be served. A lot of people make a mistake, they want to be served. Um, a good servant leader says, I know how to do this, I want to help other people do this. I wanna help other people eat. Now why you, should you start a team? You're bursting at the seams. That's the number one reason to start a team. You have too much business. Uh, you have systems and procedures which can scale growth. You have too much going on, and that's actually why a lot of C-type personalities start teams, because they have such great SOPs, but they're not great people people. And so they plug people who also are systems into technical systems, which then rain make, you know, which then continue to generate wealth for a lot of people. And then they make more as a team lead, their team makes more, et cetera, and so forth. Um, you can build something new. Don't set out to destroy the model unless you have something better to create. Now, as an ENTP, I am constantly bucking systems that may not even need to be bucked. So uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, you can accomplish more on a team, that's true. Now, that being said, you don't want a battalion size element if a rifle squad will do it. And you don't want a rifle squad if a fire team will do it better. And so sometimes the right size element for the job is really important. Um, it's better to have five agents on your team or six agents on your team, or like in the background here, um, where everyone is making $100,000 a year, than have 28 agents on your team, and I've been there too, where half of them are making less than $40,000 a year. And so um, be careful because you will create an average on your team and you want that average to be as high as possible. Um, and then ultimately you wanna honor your design, you wanna honor your one thing, what is the best uh, way for you to accomplish more at the end of the day? How can you free yourself up as a rainmaker? We'll talk more about that later. Now, why should you not start a team? You're lazy and you don't wanna do things, uh, do the things, um, you're lazy and want people to do the things that you will not.
Geez, that was a really stuttered way to say that. Uh, you're lazy. You want people to do things you're not. Oh, I don't like prospecting. I don't like doing this. I don't like doing that. So I want other people to do it. Oh, that's a crappy reason to start a team. You think it will make you look cool. Uh, listen, I fell into that too. I was like, man, I really like having six people uh, you know, on this flyer with me and on these posters with me. What if I had 28 people? Um, now, be careful with that. You know, Who are you ultimately serving? Are you serving your agents or are you serving your ego? Um, and the biggest reason not to start a team is you think it'll be easy. You've seen other people do it. You think, oh, well, that guy did it. I can do it. Um, understand, it will be hard. Just period. It will be hard. A lot of the success came from not knowing that I shouldn't be successful in the beginning. Now, uh, you need to learn how to think like a team leader. Um, think, who can I get to do this for me? Which is not a selfish question to ask. That's a question that will help you create more business opportunities around you, more jobs around you. What is my time worth? And be realistic about it. I'll ask people, hey, what's your time worth when I'm meeting with uh, team leads or people that want to have a step up? Oh, my team's worth, or uh, my time is worth $1,000 an hour. Okay, does your bank account reflect that? Let's be honest here. Let's be honest because then you have a clear slate to work with. Now, what would you pay you to do what you do? That's a pretty good indication of what you're going to be worth. Uh, delegate and create jobs. Um, again, what would you pay you to do what you do? Uh, so when you delegate, you're going to create opportunities for uh, other people to create your flyers. Maybe you're great at creating your flyers, but if someone can do it 80% as good as you and it will free you up to do the things that you do, awesome. Um, appointment booking. Someone else can hit the phones. Handling incoming calls. That in creates a, a situation where you can then be an intentional business owner instead of a reactive business owner. And then, of course, ISA is the buzzword these last several years around uh, real estate. And that is an inside sales associate. Someone who's talking to people, uh, you know, scrubbing leads, uh, you know, making phone calls. Now, if you can find a great ISA, they're worth their weight in gold. Now, that being said, not a lot of people are designed like that. It is difficult to be behind a phone for four, five, six hours a day. I would encourage you to hire local. A lot of people will hire assistants in the Philippines and have them make their phone calls and whatnot. Um, I think that everything that I stand for here with our community is all about um, circulating local wealth, helping people create local wealth. And anything that you are doing where you're hiring outside of your network is not going to increase your net worth ultimately. You want that wealth locally. You want those jobs locally, advocating for you in your business. Uh, work smarter, not harder. We'll talk a little bit more about that later too. That's a big thing in the Marine Corps. And then of course, all of this is for a reason. This frees you up to do what you do best. You are a rainmaker. So rain make. If you are not rain making, um, do a different job. Uh, my son told me, dad, I want to work for you. And I wrote this in my blog. Um, which I recommended to everyone. Less than a week ago, my son Wyatt told me, Dad, I want, when I get older, I wanna work for you. I told him, thank you, son, I really appreciate it, but I don't want you to work for me. He looked a little shocked and I went to explain to him, I don't wanna be your boss and have you be my employee. I want you to be my partner. I don't want you to work for me, but someday, if you decide you want to, I would be honored to work with you creating partnerships with your children um, that they you know want to step into. And that's one of the reasons why I keep going with our community is, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I can let this thing lapse. I'm not really connected to the outcome one way or another. But then when I have my kids and my nephews and my nieces and, you know, things like that, kids around me say, oh, you know, I want to work in our community when I get older. Um, so when you are getting ready to hire, these are the things to do. Uh, prepare uh, the disk assessments. Give people a disk link. Uh, if you want to do a questionnaire for things that are specific to you and your team, do that. Uh, if you want to have people do a resume, great. If not, that's okay too. I don't really see the need for a resume. But the truth is you want to have an easier barrier, excuse me, you want an easier barrier of entry because you don't want everyone. That should read you want an easy barrier of entry because you don't want everyone. You don't want every turkey who flocks into your door, okay? You want to make sure that you're being intentional with the people that you're adding to your team. 
Um, now, here's some questions to ask agents. Uh, this is a blog that I wrote for Lab Code Agents. Interview questions for agents who want to join your team or brokerage. Now, here are some of them. I think that there are actually 19 questions. What are your goals? Now, this is important. Some people, their goals are, you know what? Uh, I want a job that I can work while I'm retired. Um, this is going to give us a little bit of extra spending money. Or, hey, I want to work while my kids are in school. Or, you, I mean, really listen. If they're like, if their goal is, I want to make a million dollars, listen to that too, because they're telling you the truth. You just have to listen to it. Now, why are you here? Now, why are you here specifically? Why do you want to be on my team? Why do you want to join this group of people? Um, why did you choose real estate? You know, you really want to get an idea for the people that you're bringing in the door. Um, how much money do you want to make? Now, the reason why I separate this from goals is different people have different goals and believe them. Uh, S people, uh, you know, in that disc assessment are going to have different goals than high D people. And listen to them when they tell you what their goals are. Um, but then you also want to find out what their financial goals are because you want to find out if you make that money here on my team, will you stick around next year? And then when they make that money and they're talking about leaving, remind them, hey, listen, six figures wasn't even on the table for you last year. Remember, you were like, hey, listen, if I, yeah, do that, I'll stick around. And of course, you're not going to make them. You're not controlling them. You're giving an opportunity to grow your partnership versus uh, breaking a piece of it off, what they feel like they can take with them and go. And at the end of the day, you want to teach people to fish. You want them to be able to outgrow you. But, uh, but what does that look like? Um, okay. Um, are you easily offended? Um, I've gotten some surprising answers to this. Uh, I've had a lot of women tell me, no, um, it's okay to yell at me. And I tell people, I'm not here to yell at you. That's not the reason. And in fact, nobody in this business or any business anywhere or any person anywhere should be yelling at you. You know what I mean? So really listen to people and then let them know how, the way that you do business. You just want to get an idea for where people are at. How competitive are you? 11. Oh, really? Are you an 11? I can deal with honesty. How competitive are you? Four. Eight. I wish it was higher. Cool. I appreciate you being honest. Uh, what can you contribute to this team or organization? What do you bring to the table? Understand that this interview is a two-way street, right? You know, it's such a, hey, listen, these are all the great things that we can do for you. Please come in and be a part of this uh, because then they're going to come in with an entitlement mentality. But also, hey, what do you bring to the table? I know you've done a lot of things in your life. I'm sure that you're great where you were. Um, so what did you do there? What did you bring to the table? What's your X factor? Because um, you might be surprised. Uh, do you have any questions for me? That's a really important one to ask people because you want to make sure that they get an opportunity to ask the things that uh, they want to ask. And a lot of them are surprised when you ask, oh, you know what? No, I can't. I don't think so. They aren't even expecting you to ask, but then you're going to find out what, you know, what they want to know. Now, red flags. Oh, I, I just want to get my feet wet. I'm looking for a stepping stone, so I'm going to get where I want to get. Uh, now, hey, that's okay um, if that's the case, but you want to determine how much this partnership is worth. Like, are they going to close five deals in their first month and then leave? And then if that's the case, how, what is that worth to you, right? So I've never wanted to be a stepping stone for somebody, but ultimately that's what you're going to be if you're starting a team. That's one of the reasons why I like EXP because people can leave your team and not leave the partnership that you created to your organization. I want leads. Okay, great. What if I teach you how to create leads? If I show you where the leads are, you gonna leave? Or are you gonna let me help you create more opportunities for more leads? Um, entitlement. What will you do for me? Will you always answer your phone? No, I have systems and procedures so that if you need to get a hold of any one person that you can get a hold of the, the head in that. But the people that can get a hold of me are my listing lead, my buyer's lead, and my operations manager. Um, if you're not one of those three people, you can talk to me once a day during the daily conference call. We'll talk about that here in a few moments. Um, did they do their homework on you? And it's okay to ask, what are you going to do for me? What do I get by being a part of this? That's natural. That's okay. But you want to get a feel for how they are asking you. Um, and did they do their homework uh, on you? Um, yes. You want to find out whether or not they found, you know, did because this is how they're going to prepare for their clients. If they show up in a wrinkled shirt, in a wrinkled tie, and with, uh, with knowing nothing about you or who you are or what, you, you know, what your team is about, then that's how they're going to show up to that buyer's appointment. 
Now, you can either hire new agents or you can hire struggling agents that have been in the business for a while. You're not gonna hire rock star agents right off the bat. You're gonna hire good people that have the capacity for being great agents. Now, understand that's normal. Um, if you're going to hire somebody who's making $100,000 a year, why are they still on a team? Why are they not flying solo? Can you encourage them to do that? Uh, do they understand the value that you provide? A lot of new agents don't understand how much leads cost or um, you know what experience is worth. And that's sort of a situation by situation that you need to read. Uh, older agents tend to come in with bad habits, expectations, and patterns for failure which need to be broken, um, which is also just a different unique thing. It just really depends on what you want to do. Healthy people will remain loyal to personal growth or stability. Um, now, you don't want people to, are you loyal to the family? The second that somebody says family in a work organization, understand that multiple multiple human rights violations are about to be, uh, are about to occur. So you need to understand it's not family. It really isn't. It's not family. It is work. It is business. And so what does that partnership look like? Because healthy people are going to remain loyal to their personal growth, their personal stability. And really, it's one or the other. They either are a growth-minded person or they're a stability-minded person. Um, but if you give them neither, then it's going to be difficult to keep them around. You don't want the learning lead mentality if staying and growing is an option. At the end of the day, make peace with the fact that you're going to lose good agents and just say thank you for being here while you were here. Now, this is the team structure as set forth by Gary Keller. This is the wheel. Um, so if you want to get a shot of that here, um, that's the agent CEO. That's you. That's your listing specialist and anyone that goes underneath your listing specialist your marketing and administrative manager uh, and the people that fall in under them and your lead buyer specialist. Now, like I said, you wanna have really no more than three points of contact. Otherwise, you could end up leading a very unintentional and a very reactive day. Now, what does that look like ultimately? It looks like a business structure. Too many real estate agents think that they own a business, but they don't own a business. They're a solo agent. They have nothing that is scalable, growable, pass audible, uh, et cetera, and so forth. If you are creating a business, that is something that can continue to exist without you in it. Um, so there are uh, similarities between the two, of course. Uh, they allow you to divide and conquer and honor your strengths as individuals and as a team, and it limits your points of contact. Uh, now, what does that look like? It looks like a military structure. Uh, it allows for small unit leadership, uh, like I said, it limits your points of contact. It allows you to delegate tasks out to people who have specialties. Um, and then ultimately allows for accountability too. Because as a team, if you aren't someone who's like, hey, listen, uh, who's going to accomplish this? Where's the buck going to stop? It is going to continue to fall on your desk as the team leader. Now, this is not what you want right here. This is a management structure. Uh, this doesn't work. There, is too many there are too many places to hide. Um, do you want to create jobs or do you want to be productive? And ultimately, you want to be productive. This is not a structure conducive to productivity. Uh, my preferred structure. I like to have the team lead right there at the top. Um, your buyer's lead and under them will fall, fall your buyer's agents and showing assistance. Your showing assistance may te technically fall under your operation lead uh, if you um, have multiple and they're scheduling appointments for them and so forth. Um, and then your operations lead, uh, this is the person that starts off as your assistant and then hopefully grows into that role. You know, business degree, left brain type people, SC, you really don't want an I, but we're gonna get into that here later. And then of course your TC and your closing team. If you're closing so many files, you want to have a closing team, a group of people that you pass the file off to and they get it done. And then finally, your listing lead and then the agents that fall underneath them. Um, on your team, develop, assign, and remove billets and awards. Uh, have a head, a head by a buyer lead, a listing lead. Uh, titles cost nothing and instill confidence. It sounds a lot better, in my opinion, to have a director of operations than it does to have an assistant. Now, people will say, oh, I have an assistant, call my assistant. 
That's an ego talking nine times out of 10. Because what are they doing for you? You know, are they, you know, they are helping you operate. Uh, assign and remove billets when necessary. If somebody's not doing what they need to do, you can remove a billet without needing to fire somebody and still have that same kind of accountability. Um, task out, assign ideas, uh, group review, uh, push for cash incentives. Ask for reviews as a group. Hey, whoever gets the most reviews this month gets uh, a $200 prize at the end of the month or a $500 prize or whatever you wanna do. Um, leads for cash incentives. Hey, Alpha Team, you guys generated 15 leads this week, um, so you guys get this. Uh, Bravo, you guys generated this many leads. So I believe in, like I said, involving them, involving them in the process. Does it leave you vulnerable to them leaving? Yes, but it is better to teach a man to fish and then it's better to catch more fish together. So even if they think that they need to leave, they don't need to leave to be successful. You just have to show them what success looks like within your systems. Now, uh, and it also leads for competition between fire teams, between buyer's agents. The saying is it's better to have two pigs at the trough when it comes to buyer's agents. I don't like to think about it like that, but like, you know, you want somebody eating and then looking to the right and the left of them, like, you know what I mean? Because otherwise they're like, oh, I don't really know if I want to eat. Maybe I'll let the food sit there for a little while. So like, you know, it's better to have that sort of uh, competition. Um, and then of course, pass out awards like agent of the month. Uh, the Stu Smith Award was something that I passed out to the most approved agent who made a mindset switch. And it was instant and it was awesome. And of course, that was Damien Simon in 2016. The top listing agent, the most commissions earned. Recognize your team. And then these are the DISC basics. The D is dominant. They are driving. The I is your influencer. These are the people that love to talk. The C is the compliance. This is your left brain people. Hey, this is how we do it. This is the systems, this is the procedures, this is how we remain uh, in, in business, and this is how we don't get ourselves in trouble. The steadiness, S. Hey, I'm here to support everybody. I wanna see everybody grow around me, okay? Now, your first hire should be your transaction coordinator. Um, a lot of people say, if you don't have an assistant, you are one. Okay, well, do you have a business? What do you need assistance with? What do you do with your day? I mean, like, really start there. Um, if you don't have a transaction coordinator, you are one. Uh, transaction coordinators are awesome. People like to say this about assistants, like I said, no bueno. Um, what are they doing? Can they afford it? Um, it frees you up to do what you do best. Uh, on my team, it's required to use a transaction coordinator, or it was when I had a team. I don't want a team. Um, and then, of course, they cost about $400 to $600 a file. You can get a great one uh, for any one of those prices, depending on where you're at in the country. And then, uh, and your volume, of course. Volume speaks words. Um, and then your disc, you want a C or an S. You do not want an I personality as a transaction coordinator. They will talk more than they work and they will bury you at the end of the day because naturally they're pretty unorganized. And that's the truth. I've had I transaction coordinators. I've had I operations managers. It has not worked. And then, or you want an S, somebody around you that is wanting to support other people's success. Those are the only two. Second hire, add a buyer's agent. Um, leads or lead. We'll talk about that later. You either need to offer people leads or you need to lead them. Uh, provide fish or teach people how to fish. Provide with better opportunities to catch more fish together. Hire when you're bursting at the seams. And then, like I said earlier, hire at least two to start. Somebody says, hey, I'm thinking about hiring a buyer's agent. If you're gonna hire one, hire two. If you're gonna hire two, you might as well hire three because it's gonna take you the same amount of time to train them, maybe just a little bit more, incrementally more, and one of them is probably gonna leave. There will be attrition. And then you wanna have somebody that can help train the people to, that come in behind you. Um, so I always say plan on growth, don't plan on uh, on slowing down. And real estate, with, with markets being cyclical, there are always things that you could do to grow in any market. Um, okay, now higher when bursting at the seams, people want a growth or stability mindset. Uh, and that's depending on their I or their S, their D or their C. Do not coach agents to be you. Coach them to be the best version of them. That I can't tell you how many team leads can't keep team members because they're trying to coach them all to be them. They are not many yous. Uh, splits can be 50-50, they can be 60-40, 75-25. Be more concerned with the income than the splits. 
right? How much money are they going to be netting? How much money are they going to be making? Because I can tell you what, if people are making money, they're not going to be too much worried or too worried about how much money you're making. If they're making two hundred thousand dollars, they're not going to be worried about how much money you're making. Um, and then these, you really want these are your eyes. I put these two pictures in the background for a reason. You will only see this many people crowded around one laptop if they are all eye personalities. Do you see all those people smiling, staring at one laptop? Those are all eyes. And you'll only have a five-way high five if they're all, all eye personalities. No one else is going to ever even think about doing that. Um, so, <laughs> so that's really what you want to do. It, you can provide uh, Ds with buyer agent opportunities, but you want to make sure that uh, there is enough for them to sink their teeth into where they will leave. Uh, they'll get bored. Um, now, if you decide to go the showing assistant route versus a buyer's agent route, uh, this is the way that you would structure that. That's basically the door openers. It's a different way to go about it than the traditional buyer's agent route. And a lot of times, uh, it's a better way to do it. But it really depends on you and how you want to grow your team. There's less responsibility for them. They're essentially opening doors. They aren't writing contracts. They aren't talking about the offers. They do have to be licensed, but you can either put them on a salary, and of course we'll talk about this in a minute. Um, less experience is required to do this job, and less experience is expected of them. Hey, I'm a showing assistant, that's my job title. And if they're calling themselves that, nobody is expecting them to know how to negotiate a contract. Um, there's more, more ultimate control for the team lead by centralizing power within your administrative team. If you have an amazing administrative team, everything else can come and go. You want to have that core group that can support this. Um, and then their split is 25-75, or 75 going to the team lead. They understand that they make less money because there's less responsibility. And these are gonna be your S, your C, or your I that, um, that sort of like, and if it's an I, it's an ENFP, um, it's not an ENFJ because they want to be in a situation where they're kind of a little bit more relaxed. They're campaigning for something, <laughs> right? Uh, in my opinion, and of course, these are just opinions. Your third hire is your assistant or your operations manager. Uh, this is your most important hire as this will eventually be your replacement. Uh, you want them to be salaried. They get something that nobody else gets on the team. They get a salary plus a bonus structure. I like to have a per file bonus structure because it incentivizes them to also get it closed. Um, and this could be, you know, hundred dollars per file on top of their on top of their structure. Now, understand if you're closing fifteen to twenty deals a month, that's an additional two thousand dollars on top of maybe their three thousand dollar base. So that's a lot of opportunity for them to make more money. Uh, someone to balance out your energy and complement your shortcomings. Where do you lack? Uh, bonus them when they take work off your plate. Anytime that an assistant or an operations manager steps in and they want to help facilitate and free you up, that allows you more opportunities to do what you do best. And then salary, there is either going to be an hourly uh, agreement with weekly hours. Like, hey, this week, I only need you for 15 hours. This week, I only need you for this. It's, hey, listen, that's about 30 hours a week or it's going to be 30 hours a week. And this is how much uh, we're going to pay. This is the bonus structure on top of that. Right, but you do not want to overly fluctuate, especially into the ne the negative. Your assistant or operations manager or admins, because they'll leave, they'll leave because there's not enough stability in it. Um, and then your fourth hire and your final hire is the one that replaces you in the business. Um, only hire when you're operating at capacity, in my opinion. Sellers will accept this more easily if you market your team versus marketing you as the individual. Um, we'll go over this more later. The split is going to be 40 to 60, 25, 75, 50, 50, depending on the expectations, the support and the volume, right? So, uh, if you're expecting them to do more, handle more phone calls, you're going to pay them more. If uh, you're going to support them more and free them up to do what they do best, which is go on listing appointments, then, uh, then maybe it's a little bit less, but they make more in volume. And then in the disc, these are your high D drivers. Sit me out, baby. I want more appointments. Woo! And that's the sort of energy that you want behind that. And if you're not getting them enough, they'll tell you. And then here are your optional hires. Um, An inside sales associate, optional. Uh, somebody to handle your marketing, it's optional. Lead generation, optional. 
uh, somebody who does your events, your flyer distri distribution, event planning, et cetera. Now, the market is shifting. And so these are a lot of the people that are the first ones on the chopping block, especially in a blue collar recession. These are the first jobs to go, the first expenses that get cut um, when a team slows down. Um, and so just understand that. Now, here are reasons to join start a team. It helps you to appear larger than you are alone. It allows you to pool resources, uh, such as um, events, holding multiple open houses open. You get six, seven, eight, nine, ten agents all holding open houses all at the same time. It's amazing how many open house signs can go out in a community. Um, it allows you to pool resources. As it, 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 we all have a team assistant, but you know it's better to not call them an assistant. And then that frees them up to do what they do best, to go out showing, to be out prospecting. Uh, you can ultimately catch more together. And of course, belonging to a community is a reason to start, the main reason to join, start a team, because people like to be a part of a tribe. They like to eat together. Uh, your job as a team lead is to build relationships. Ultimately, above all things, is to build relationships. Uh, your network will determine your net worth. Uh, you want to be a door opener. And we're going to tell you a bunch of different doors that you can open up later for your team that will help you rain make, get recognized, help encourage, encourage your brand to become dominant in the local area. Uh, and we'll dive into that here in a moment. But you want to observe your team in action. You want to quickly cut out cancers. And we've talked about this before. These are unproductive and negative agents. So if they're unproductive, but they're positive, that's okay. If they're productive, um, but they're negative, that's eh, okay too. They're, you know, that's all right. But if they're unproductive and they're negative, cut them out freaking immediately. Is that Uncle Uncle Joey? Cut it out. Yeah. Cut them out. Um, eagles don't pal around with turkeys. Keep up the average caliber. You want to build culture. You want to train, work, and play with your agents, uh, and then provide growth and stability. Your job is to train, train, train. Invest team resources back into the team, uh, more time, energy, and money. You wanna provide a balance of growth and stability like we just talked about, broaden horizons, expose your team to new thoughts. A big part of when we were growing was, I wanted people to be exposed to a financial planner. I wanted them to understand their taxes so that they didn't walk into some of the same problems that I ultimately ended up experiencing. Um, don't ever ask anyone to do anything that you wouldn't uh, do or have not done. And don't add people to add people. We've talked about that a little bit. It should feel a little cult-like, but everyone has to drink the Kool-Aid, including you. Now, we've all seen this meme before, the difference between a boss and a leader. Uh, the boss is up there on the top, the leader is down there in the trenches, but you also have to maintain your 10,000 foot perspective. You need to be able to work on your business instead of in your business. Now, when you're team building, it's really important to consider the source. There's a lot of bad advice around the water cooler. Uh, understand that if somebody's talking to you about team building and they have never had a successful team or their team is a failure, don't listen to them. Track your expenses. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. Adam Nelson told me that early in my career. That is a huge one. Um, you will lose time and money. It's better to have invested both. Uh, again, leadership from the 10,000 foot level. This is Lessons from the Hanwha Hilton. That's a great book that you should read. You want to maintain your king and your queen energy and or your queen energy, depending on who you are. <laughs> but, uh, but at the end of the day, a lot of the warrior energy will get you started in business, but your king, your queen will maintain your business. And we talked a little bit about that in the DISC, Myers-Briggs, and King Warrior Magician Lover class. Um, be a worthy leader of a group. A tribe is a group of people that you would feel compelled to share the last of your food with. Now, enjoy the journey and the spiritual practice of your business, real estate. Um, that Zen business is my book. It's an Eastern approach to this Western business climate of greed and corruption and scarcity by responding with love. Um, okay, say what you mean, mean what you say, but don't say it mean. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm brutally honest. Well, remove that. Here's a couple of the books that I want you to get. Lessons from the Hanwha Hilton. Um, it's a great one. I'm not going to go into these too much. My book is in business. And then, of course, King Warrior, Magician Lover. Um, all are available on Amazon. If it's lonely at the top, you're doing it wrong. Oh, man, it's lonely up at the top. I have no peers. Okay, well, that's because you're a terrible leader. Uh, monthly one-on-ones. Um, 
This is part of your requirement as a job. If you can't meet with your team in person at least once a month, you know, uh, you might want to consider doing something else. And of course, there are always exceptions to every rule, but I speak to the rule more than I speak to the exception. Um, sales therapy. In order to help a person sell, you have to help a person's soul. That's the truth. I've had some people walk in kind of emotionally, spiritually broken and help them to get patched up, help them believe in themselves. They become uh, really good at what they do. They become an expert and they can feed their family. What's getting in the way? Diagnose that. Is it scheduling? Is it a spouse? Is it a kid? Or is it the illusion of all these things, right? Oh, well, they all expect all these different things of me. What do you expect of you? What is, what is, what are you, what are the vibes you're sitting out, sitting out there? And then of course yourself, nine times out of 10, it's you getting in the way. It's you. Now, which of the three breakdowns of the deal is preventing the sell? And this is something that we taught earlier in another one of the master classes. Uh, is it getting the lead? Is it scheduling the appointment or is it writing the offer at the appointment? Did they lead generate? It's like figure out, hey, um, well, how many open houses, Joel? How many, you know, how many, uh, how many leads did, did I send you? Okay. Um, how many appointments did, did you then book with the leads that you generated? That's the second breakdown. And then how many offers did you write based on the showings that you attended? Right. Okay. Those are the three breakdowns. Pretty easy to diagnose where it's falling apart. Uh, and then redirect for the next month with clear tasks and tools. Uh, limit repeated issues by offering solutions. Uh, one of the things I like to say, hey, listen, that's not your fault. That's my fault. It's the first time it happened, right? Or it's nobody's fault, right? The second time, hey, that's definitely my fault. I just, I didn't explain it. The third time, hey, listen, you got to grab a pen. Wait, no, excuse me. I messed up my own story. I'm going to have to start that over. Rewind 15 seconds. Hey, first time, hey, no big deal. You didn't know better, right? Second time, grab a pen. Let's make sure that this doesn't happen again. I'm sure that that was my fault. And the third time is you're fired. If the, the third time people continue to ask you the same, uh, people are looking at me like I'm a little bit crazy. A lot of gas are all around the room. Um, you know, so listen, you have to be willing to do that. You have to be willing to cut out the cancers. So um, if, if that ultimately is what ends up happening, you cannot waste your time of continuing to coach somebody who is uncoachable, who is unwilling. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And if they're not going to drink, then, uh, you know, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, you want to make sure that they're practicing uh, family care and self-care. My family's great. Everything's great. Hey, man, you closed 10 deals last month. That's awesome. How great is your, is your family? What's the last time you really che checked in with them, right? Um, how great are you? How's your health? How are you eating? Um, daily conference call. Keep these freaking quick. A lot of people just love to hear themselves speak, like myself, and they'll keep their calls very long. But you should be offering a lot of substance. It should be minimal and lead to movement. Let's talk about that. Hey, what was your win of the day? What did you do yesterday? What was your daily game? What's your daily win? Um, what is your plan for the day today? What are you going to do today? And hey, that's all right. You freaking blew it yesterday, but you're going to do it today, right? Okay. Third, uh, so in, do you have any questions for me? This is their opportunity to talk to their team lead. You know, a lot of opportunity, a lot of times, if they know that a bunch of other people are going to be listening to them ask the question, they're going to try to get the question answered by another agent on the team, by the transaction, the operations lead, et cetera, and so forth. And they'll find that they don't have to ask you. But if you make yourself available once a day, let's say 8 a.m., for all of these questions, then it allows you to get on the same page with everybody. And then everyone hears the progress of other agents. They hear, they hear what they're doing or what they're not doing. And then that way, if they're not the agent of the month, if they're not closing, if they're complaining, well, they know because they weren't offering daily wins. They weren't accomplishing their plans of the day. And it's a sort of accountability without calling it accountability. Um, and then ultimately, uh, it should put you in a situation to where there are no follow-up calls. Your phone should not close after 15 minutes um, your flip phone should not close after 15 minutes, only to have somebody call you like, hey man, I just had a quick question. No, 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 we don't do that. Your time to ask the question was the conference call. And then that way you get to be intentional instead of reactive. Now a tribe, like I said, is a group of people that you would feel compelled to share the last of your food with. This is not a real estate book. This is not a business book, but it does uh, display some of the culture rot in society. People don't mind struggling. They, In fact, they really enjoy it. 
if you give people something to struggle towards, they will struggle with you. But uh, people can't stand not doing anything. Um, leads versus leadership. This is the big slide. Um, and there's a couple more that are really awesome. Teaching people to fish can be scary. What if they go out and catch fish without me? Okay. But understand that your niche is secure. Your job is a rainmaker, so be a rainmaker. Can you catch more fish together with better systems? Information is king and it is free. And we're going to talk about who to tap for information here in a moment. You just need to know where to look. Um, and of course, sponsor an event, bring people to you, chum the water, right? Chum the water, bring them to you. Um, brick walls are there for a, a reason to stop the people who don't want it badly enough. They're there to stop the other people. And this is one of my favorite books. It's called The Last Lecture by Randy Posh. Um, guy finds out that he's dying. Uh, terminal. He's a lecturer. He puts together one last lecture. And uh, hey, brick walls are there to stop other people. So find a way around it. Now, people are our greatest resource. It is time that we act like it. Involve the community in your business. Now, partner with the title representative. This is your, in, in my opinion, this is your most important partnership outside of your direct business. Um, information is more valuable than ever, uh, it, more, more valuable than money, and it's free. You know, the question should not be, hey, can we, do you want to co-spend on an ad spend? Hey, you, you, how much marketing dollars can we throw at this problem together? It's how do we use these tools and these resources to the best of our ability to uh, produce the greatest yield? Now, um, you have to be able to measure it, to market it. You guys see in the background, I just looked up public schools. I just pulled up all the, everything in, uh, that was close by. Um, you can get a veterans list from your title rep. Uh, call and offer value. Hey, veterans, uh, hey, I'm just giving you a call. I know that you're a veteran here in the area. You can slide out or you can make these calls personal. Of course, personal calls, personal touch, more important. Hey, I know that you're a veteran. First of all, I just want to call and say, I really appreciate what you've done or ha you know, have done, uh, what you are doing, et cetera, and so forth. And then I also want to invite you out to our Veterans Day barbecue. I'll just say thank you. We're going to have some giveaways. You know, this organization is going to be there. That organization is going to be there. Um, but more importantly, it's going to be an opportunity for you to hang out with other, other vets. Um, you can find people who are over 55 years of age that have stairs, that are in two stores. Hey, how are your knees feeling? You can really do whatever it is that you want to do. It's up to you how you want to use the information. Now, of course, notice that the faults are huge right now. Currently, there are 685,000 homes in a state of serious delinquency throughout the country. Um, tap into those three D's if you want to. Again, this is information. You do with it what you want. The three D's are death, divorce, and default. So, you know, growing a lawyer network, uh, creating an awards gala for lawyers and a lawyer event, you know, bring the business to you. Uh, set up your farm. You must be relevant somewhere to be relevant anywhere. Now, here are some doors to unlock. Uh, like I said, build a lawyer partnership. Um, we've been working on our partnership with the Gray Legal Group. Um, find your the best lawyer in your area. Call them up. Build a partnership with them. Uh, find the wedding venues. Build a partnership with a 3D ultrasound technician. Um, there's so many different things that you can do. Build relationships with your high school so that you can teach in them about real estate so you can recruit. You can also pass on this gift. You can sponsor their team, sponsor their school with every commission. You can be the official real estate agent of this high school, that high school, this college. Um, and then semi-pro sports teams. Everyone wants to go after that those professional ball players. But I can tell you, hey, semi-pro athletes are making some money too. Maybe they want to make, they want to set down some roots. They want to you know buy a house or whatnot. Um, so being the official agent of the Lake Elsinore Storm, the uh, you know whatever, whoever it is, the baseball team, the basketball team, whatever the G League is in your area, um, and then sponsor, host events, bring people to you. Okay, uh, like I've said, have people come to you. You can have comedy events. Contact your local comedian. Ask them if they want to hold a, a, a show in your office. Uh, Easter, 4th of July, Halloween, Christmas. We had a client events class. I strongly encourage you to check it out. A baby shower. Anything that is about a major life event in someone's uh, life that's occurring. They might buy a house, right? A baby shower, a wedding event, 
a graduation event, they might be downsizing. They might be needing to buy more, et cetera and so forth. Might be first time home buyers. Uh, we had a guitar center showcase here. There's 60 freaking parents in there. So they had the market shifting. Give me a call if you need to sell some real estate. If you need to buy, you know, God help you. If you need to sell, it's coming down quick, right? Everyone laughs a little bit, set them up, get on with my life. We, we have worked with the Girl Scouts. We've worked with senior groups, women's groups, veterans groups, Christian groups, etc., and so forth. Now the market is shifting, so this is the right time. It's the perfect time to double down or shift your business and your energy towards sellers. In a seller's market, you want to market to buyers because buyers bring listings. Listings are impossible to get, right? Everyone gets ready, leave me alone. Okay, well, market yourself to buyers because no one's marketing to them. Now, during a buyer's market, you market yourself to sellers because <coughs> that's ultimately what you want anyway. You want to control the listings, you list the last. And of course, we have our listing masterclass, which I would encourage you to check out. Now, lifestyle branding, our community. I'm going to teach a whole class about our community, but here's some, you know, things to consider uh if you are in the real estate conversation by being in conversations all around real estate so control the narrative around everything in your community and then when their community needs to buy or sell real estate they're going to you as the lifestyle for that area uh, make your brand cool and accessible uh comedians are cooler than i am unfortunately uh you know a lot of these you know musicians are cooler than i am unfortunately i'm not very cool um i I'm not wearing my white New Balances with my dad jeans today, but I wear dad jeans for every single one of these presentations. I'm just not cool. Comedy, hip hop, high school, the community, uh, in micro communities, in communities within communities. How do you serve this church, uh, this group, uh, this whatever, you know, I don't need to give a bunch of examples. Now, nine to five, Monday through Friday, it's about real estate, but before and after hours, we're building community too. Um, I can teach, mentor, and participate in passion projects with yield potential because of passive income. It allows the ENTPs to be the mad genius and to come up with different ideas that might have yield potential without feeling like it is a waste of time. Now, the last thing that I'm going to ask you about your office and something to really consider is if your office went out of business with the community notice. I heard, heard somebody say that, ask that about a church. If your church went out went under with the community notice. I'm thinking, well, geez, this is church, right? Wherever two or more gather. If my church, if my business, if my spiritual practice went under with the community notice. And if they don't, that reflects on my spirituality, but the way that I have gotten involved in the community. Because if you think that Zen is meditating on top of a mountain, why are you involved in the rest of the world anyway? It is the practice, it is the art of being involved. Okay, I really wanna encourage you to establish boundaries. Um, this is so incredibly important when you're building uh, to, to make sure you don't overstep your mark. Uh, it will take intensity to build, that's true. Um, it will not take a whole lot of balance. You're gonna to have to live your life out of balance if you wanna be a team lead, um, especially during times of growth. But you need to learn how to maintain that or uh, how to do that intermittently without losing your health and losing your mind. It will take consistency to maintain. So know when to slow down. Uh, maintain your mental health. I'm a huge advocate for therapy. Um, it's It will make you a better businessman by getting in touch with yourself or businesswoman. Um, when will you not answer the phone? When will you not work? I used to brag that I got up from the dinner table to go do showings. I used to brag, oh, you can always reach me. I'll take your phone call in the middle of the night. You don't need to do that. You're not the president of the United States. You don't have to take a phone call at midnight. Uh, what does success look like to you and the important people around you? Hey, honey, what does success look like to us? What would it look like? Financially, what does it look like in our day to day? What does it look like with us eating? What does our day look like if we're successful? Um, and you can have a lot of money and lack real wealth. Uh, so honor your design. A lot of people talk about honoring their agents. Honor who you are in the system. Where do I fit in the system? Uh, what am I good at? What do I love doing? If you're, uh, if you're good at it but you hate it, don't do it. Okay? And if you're not good at it but you love it, don't do it. So if you're a great singer but you hate it, find a freaking different job. But if you're a terrible singer but you love it, you know, 
don't count on getting paid, right? So it's something to think about. Now, what do I love doing? I love mentoring and teaching without handholding. I don't want to be wiping butts. I've got five kids. I don't need to wipe your butt. I've got a dog. I've got to take care of his poop. I've got to take care of my cat's poop. I've got to take care of the fish's poop. I don't want to be butt wiping, you know, and handholding. Um, at a certain time, it was a great time in my life. I loved it. It was a blast. But I'm just not there anymore. My kids need me. Um, now, I love creating new and improved ways of doing old things. I love to give tools. Plus, I can always refer out business. So in my capacity right now, I could have the benefit of having a buyer's agent without having a buyer's agent. I could refer out at 50-50. And I'm not handholding. I know that the person's gonna go to a great agent. They're gonna get taken care of in a great way. I'm gonna get paid. They're gonna get paid. Um, but I don't have to be involved in their business. Uh, running a team is a lot of energy and it's a whole lot of alchemy. So you gotta be protective of your time, protective of your energy. And if you're uh, if you're not protected, it's like it's like an organ. Your time is like an organ. And if you don't treat it like an organ, then uh, you know be careful. Now, as far as real estate coaching goes, I'm really not a big fan of real estate coaching. Um, we know what we need to do. Why are you not doing it? Pick up a copy of Zen Business on Audible, or you know, pick up a hard copy of it, and just ask yourself the real questions. Why are you not doing it? You know what you need to do. Why do you need to pay somebody two thousand dollars a month to do that? That person's not your friend. Second, that that co that check stops cashing. You're going to be in a rough way because I'll tell you a lot of these organizations will turn on you. They'll eat you alive. A lot of these, you know, these they are not in it for the right reasons, and they will, you know, at the heart of it. What's the heart of it? If it's money, if it's money, and they're not invested in you as a person spiritually, and that's not a spiritual practice for them. If the god that they worship is money, they will drop you like a bad habit. Just be careful. Who are you worshiping? What are you worshiping? You can only have one god. Um, now, mentorship is free. Mentorship is free. Uh, you could treat someone to breakfast, coffee, or lunch, right? But make sure you show up. Ultimately, I stopped showing up to breakfast, coffee, and lunch because people kept not showing up. I'm like, people have anxiety. People have depression. I understand. You set the fucking appointment. You set the appointment. You show up. You're going to take control of the bull. You're going to grab the bull by the horns. You're going to sit me down. Let's freaking sit down. Let's talk, man. Let's hammer it out. I will give you everything. I'll give you the keys to the castle to show up, right? But also understand as team leads, as you go on, if you take every coffee date that you're, uh, that you're offered, you will be jittery and unproductive. <laughs> you know, if I took every coffee date that I was offered, I would get nothing done because I would just be having coffee all day. So just get to a point to where you understand it's okay to pick people's brains. It's okay to ask. But understand you might get a no. That's why brick walls are there for reasons. Keep out the people who don't want it enough. Um, now, you can also have a sponsor. You can join EXP Realty. You can name your sponsor. Of course, David Serpa, S-E-R-P-A. You can fill that in. You, you know, I could help you out big time. Now, uh, now join EXP Realty. My phone number is 951-691-7798. Name David Serpa as your sponsor or whoever shared this video with you. Um, you can join accountability groups. The core coaching often is free and you just have to show up. You just have to be there. Um, and don't overcoach. Don't overcoach. Do not overtrain. Uh, do not over prepare. You have to get in the trenches. Ultimately, people, they want to be a real estate agent, but they don't want to practice real estate. Now, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. That's great. I heard all about your plan. I heard about your three-month plan, your six-month plan, your business plan, your five-year plan. That's great. Get in the freaking trenches. Right? The best laid plans of mice and men. Um, microphone or muzzle, what do you want? An insecure broker or brokerage will be threatened by you. They'll be threatened by your success. They'll be threatened by your team. They'll, you know, be, you would be surprised. They're getting paid, but, you know, a lot of these brokers, they want to stifle you in your success. I said the same thing six years ago. I said the same thing six years ago. And I mean it. I meant every word. Uh, brokers will be threatened by growth. And when they are threatened by growth, because they don't love your business, they want to control your business, they'll want to manage you. And so just be careful. You've got to put yourself in the driver's seat of your business. You've got to put yourself in the driver's seat of your brand. If you do not own your brand, somebody else owns your brand, period. So that's why you have to have an individual brand underneath your brokerage. You have to stand out as well, right? Superwoman of real estate, right? Okay, Zach's got a great brand. Spencer's got a great brand. You know, better call mom, right? All these different things, you know, but the thing, you have to stand out. People 
Don't get lost. Don't lose your identity to your brokerage. Our business is our lifeblood. Who should ultimately get the final say? Your broker or you? You're the one working. You're the one who's put in the blood, sweat, and tears in the trenches. You should have the ultimate say in your business. Now, uh, you can get a stage or uh, you can get a stage or a microphone, but have ownership in it or own it. If you do not own the stage, if you do not own the microphone, you can be deplatformed. And look, look, we see new media, right? Uh, somebody starts a YouTube channel with a bunch of other people, or they come in and meet somebody else. Like uh, The Hill did it with Crystal and Sagar, which are two, you know, newscasters. And then ultimately, they had to break off and start their own program, Breaking Points, to continue to grow. Own the stage, own the microphone, or at least have ownership in it or risk being deplatformed. Now, EXP Realty has empowered me locally and internationally. So, yes, I've got my local business. Yes, I have our community, uh, which is our local brand of EXP Realty. But on top of that, I've got ownership in Alaska and Beverly Hills in Germany, in, in Germany. So it has empowered me internationally to grow my business. Uh, these are things that you can't accomplish alone. Now understand that you are the brand. You are more important than the logo. People work with people that they know, like, and trust. If sellers had a good experience with that big box brand, they would go back to the big box brand and that specific agent. Oh, I love Keller Williams, First Team, Coldwell, etc., because such and such works there. She's my agent. Versus if somebody had a bad experience with that box. Oh, you know what? I worked with an agent for that brokerage and I hated them. I'm never going to work with that brokerage again. Right? So if somebody had a positive experience, they're not going back to you because they love Remax. They're going back to the, the Remax agent that they work with. Right? The individual. The individual, right? So that's why it's important not to lose yourself to a brand. If someone's had a bad experience, like I said, they avoid the brand everywhere. Most brokers are broke. They need you. They're not out there doing, they're not out there in the trenches. They're not out there practicing. They don't have an agent-owned company. And so they're like, please, go transact. I remember reading this article that really pissed me off. And it was this, hey, listen, if, if you let everybody work for 90% and you're not you know, getting your 80-20, then they're taking 10% from you. I'm like, that's 10% that did not exist. That is 10% that did not exist without that agent who was willing to go out and work for it. And that's why I believe in uh, agent partnership much more than I believe in uh, having a brokerage that uh, or a broker that is in front of me. I want to have people that I believe in that I can reach out and call. Um, now, most brokers are broke. That's why they need you. Now, check out my class on branding. Again, it's important. Just sink your teeth into it real quick. Um, you'll learn a lot and I don't want to repeat myself. Build something that you believe in or join a movement that you believe in. Ultimately, people want to join a movement. They want big, hairy, audacious goals, as Rick Gia likes to say. Now, if you have a crap split, you got to do one of three things. You got to negotiate that crap split into a better split. You need to justify that crap split by getting more money or you need to leave. Use it as a wedge. Find somewhere else, right? Negotiate. See if you can get a better deal. The best way to negotiate is to have a wedge. Hey, listen, you know, Johnny Broker, uh, you know, I know that you said that you won't give me 90% unless I close a certain amount of deals this year, but I already got that deal from this broker down the street. So will you honor it? Will you match? Right? That's having a wedge. A wedge is your way in the door. It is that little like pizza shaped thing that you just slam it between the door so that it stays open, right? Uh, and then you keep pushing it open and pushing it open. Now, or they need to justify the split. Hey, we've got a great, uh, you get leads. We have a referral network. These are awesome systems. Ultimately, you will make more money with this brokerage because of the value that we are offering you in exchange for the split. And then finally, leave. Interview. This is supposed to say three. That must have gotten autocorrected. Interview three different brokerages and or teams to pursue greener pastures. And I actually have an, another blog that I wrote. It's just it's switching to, thinking about switching uh, brokerages or teams. 19 questions to ask leadership. Uh, you want to make sure that the place that you're landing is a place that has growth opportunity and uh, that it's not a, you know, like a huge team where no one's closing deals, right? Like everything is negotiable. I wish somebody would have told me this at the beginning of a career, of my career. Everything is negotiable. Your split is negotiable. Your fees are negotiable. 
really, unless you're an EXP, and a lot of this is because everybody gets the same deal. But a lot of these, hey, listen, I want to buy a box store. You got these, all these bums that you got to pay for, right? What's it worth to you, right? What's the split? No, negotiate your fees. Hey, I know that you charge desk fees. I don't want to pay desk fees. In fact, me and my team, we're not paying desk fees, right? Ownership. Hey, I want some ownership in this building that I'm building, right? Or if they're not offering you ownership, come to EXP. Will you ever get ownership? Day one. We're all agent owners. You have to build that in your organization. Where do you find value? Ultimately, I beat the cap with my revenue share. I beat the cap with my stock. Um, I beat the cap with uh, you know with opportunities for the, the to earn that entire cap back in stock. So there's a lot of different ways to get value in exchange for the percentage, right? How will I ultimately net more money for me and my family? Um, agents leave teams. Suck it up. That's the truth. Agents leave teams. Build organization that partners never have to leave in order to grow. Okay, the splits. Franchise fees kill splits. You have an 8% franchise fee, 9% franchise fee, 11% franchise fee. Ask your broker. That is the quickest way to put more money in your pocket and your team's pocket by just eliminating that franchise fee. Why pay 8% of your commissions to somebody that you're never going to meet? You don't want to be the poster child for a bad deal, even if they make an exception. Hey, Serpa, you've got a great team. We won't charge you a franchise fee. Great. But the assumption to everybody around me is that I'm being charged a franchise fee and you're charging everyone else a franchise fee. And if the value isn't there, drop it for everybody or drop it for nobody. Now, many of these companies are even offering loans. They know that they can't keep up with uh, new emerging brokerages, mainly EXP, the fastest growing brokerage on the planet, the cloud brokerage. <laughs> uh, and so they started offering loans. Hey, listen, here's $13,000, but you gotta uh, sign um, an agreement to be with us for two years. And then you're actually gonna have to buy your way out of your contract, right? Um, and of course, what is that ultimately worth in your split? If you're freaking in a 90-10 and you took out a $13,000 loan, my God, that was easy, that was cheap, you're awfully cheap. Uh, you don't wanna give 8% of your money to someone that you don't know. Uh, and ultimately, 100% of zero is nothing. So if you are at a big brokerage, if you're at a big box store where they're going to charge you a franchise fee, of course, it's me there are no franchise fee, uh, fees. You want to be able to justify it, right? So you want to be able to make more money. But ultimately, I want to go to where the value is. And if I can pay less money, $16,000, and if I can uh, make more money in revenue and in stock and in ownership and in my organization and uh, get great tools, why would I not want to do it? Okay, the XP Realty is like offering everyone ownership in your team. Because when you get paid, they get paid. Hey, you want to build ownership in this team? I know you might not be here forever. You might you want to jump off and start your own team. You might want to build your own, our community. You might want to start your own brand of EXP Realty. But while you're here, build some ownership in this. Build some ownership, get paid while everyone else is getting paid. Uh, guarantee you will not be denied the opportunity to continue to economically grow with your partners. It sucks to have an agent have to leave your team or brokerage for opportunity. Uh, I lamented for Susan when I left Exit because she was she couldn't offer me enough value to keep me around. And a lot of times these brokers end up in that I can't offer you enough value to keep you around. And so they end up offering sweetheart deals to two or three agents in the office, hoping to keep everyone else around. But everybody knows about it. And so ultimately at the end of the day, people want to grow in soil that is large enough to handle their growth. Um, I beat my cap in revenue share and in stocks. Uh, price is an issue in the absence of value. If you're not offering a value, I don't offer a huge split. Plus, everyone has the same opportunity to grow their organization. Everyone has the same opportunity that I had day one. Um, and our community is, of course, powered by EXP Realty. This, this would not be possible without EXP. Now, here's some additional thoughts. How big is too big? That's a question really to ask yourself. You know, how many people do I really want to have on my team? How many, how much money is enough money? If I'm making five hundred thousand dollars a year, is that enough? Because I hit that market, then I try to keep going. I try to keep going, and ultimately, uh, your mind will go, your body will go, your spirit will go, and you just want to make sure that you are maintaining something that is good for growth. Um, why do you want to build a team? And follow the thought all the way through to the end. I want to be on stages talking about my experience with a microphone, you know, all over the country. Okay, um, how much are you going to pay for that? You know, what brokerage is going to offer you that opportunity? You know, and ultimately, you can't find that anywhere. You can find it anywhere. So, 
But why do you want to do it? And how much is it worth to you? Is it worth the hours? Is it worth the time away from your family, et cetera, and so forth? Are you building a better life? Do you want to create generational wealth for you and your family? Um, and then one of the really the dumbest things that agents do, they don't even have a 3% market share in their neighborhood and they're running off to start expansion teams all over the country. And I thought about that before too. Start an expansion team. Why? So you could try to get 3% in another market? Take that 3%, try to grow that to 10%. That's where the value is. That's where the money is. The most successful Remax agent in the world was somebody who had a 95% market share in their tiny little market of like Tuscaloosa, Alabama, or uh, wherever it was. Darren Campbell tells the story. It's a good one. Um, now, don't overexpand your territory too quickly. Don't march on Russia in winter. Uh, take a moment to step back and look at your business. Why am I growing? Why am I leaving this brokerage? Why am I doing this? Because you can't overshoot the mark. Um, Measure your annual commission close to home. So look at how much commission changed hands within a mile of your home. I'd love to see people post that in the comments, within a mile of your office. I can tell you most of the people that are running their neighborhoods, it's between 1.9 million and 3.8 million about, that's the range for these tiny little neighborhoods because there's so much money changing hands in your backyard. So serve your neighborhood and serve your community. Make it possible for them to feed their families. They'll make it possible for you to feed your family. Now, finally, a king or queen prepares his kingdom for his departure. Right? And then there's there's Scar in the background, hating everybody, trying to take money away from everybody, hating everyone's growth, being threatened by everyone. And then there's Mufasa up at the front. Mufasa. Just like, hey. Everything's green and lush. The soil even dies underneath Scar. Look at his, look at his grumpy. Ah, this is all mine. Uh, resentment, anger, right? That's a shadow, right? Okay, when we talk more about this, you know, in the King Warrior Magician Lover class, uh, my kingdom, my ownership in my kingdom is worth more with more kings and queens. If I can launch a bunch of kings and queens in my market and in other markets, my ownership, my kingdom is worth more. Um, my kingdom is more secure because I'm diversified. I'm in different markets all over the place. Maine is not going to experience the same recession that we're going to experience here. Right? They're in the blue. Their year over year inventory is low. Okay? So having ownership in different markets is great. I'm diversified. EXP Realty. My real ownership in this company is something that my wife will continue to own. She'll inherit when I'm dead, right? She's a licensed real estate agent. She's my teammate, okay? When she dies or when if I die, whoever croaks first, and that's really what you're doing. You're preparing your kingdom. Our kids, hopefully, are licensed at that time. They can inherit it, right? So build something that is real that you can pass on. Um, otherwise, you're building a kingdom in your head. Like, oh, I've got this great kingdom in my head that I'm passing on. Um, I'm putting work into my name so that there's equity in it for my children. I want the name Serpa to be worth something. I want it to be able to open up doors. Um, now, ultimately, you can control or love your business as a leader. You can control or love other people's businesses. Um, your job is to bring order to the chaos and continue to push forward. Gary Keller calls us being a chaos coordinator in the one thing. I'm going to leave you with a couple of quotes here. Now, if you build a man a fire, he's warm for the night. If you teach a man to build fire, he's warm when he builds a fire. But if you set a man on fire, you've warmed him for a lifetime. <laughs> it's not supposed to make sense. All right, any questions? Anyone? All right. So, hey, I appreciate everybody watching uh, for another master class. Uh, we have done, I think, six or seven of these so far. We're going to continue to do them. Uh, if you're a brand new agent, if you haven't even passed your test yet, join Real Estate Exam Study Group. I'm an uh, admin in this group along with Stuart Jacobson. It's a great resource for passing the test. Uh, join Lab Coat Agents. Uh, it is the number one network of agents internationally, and it is a great resource for you as well. And of course, I would encourage you to join EXP Realty. Uh, be a part of my organization. Let's grow together. Uh, my number is 951-691-7798. And I'm happy to send you uh, a uh, PowerPoint of this presentation if you want to teach it or if you just want the notes. Um, thank you for watching. I appreciate it. We'll be back with another masterclass next week.